Today on TwinCam, we're looking at this brochure for the Volvo range from 1979. A little while ago, I uploaded a video on the Volvo 300 series, and as I began digging through my little stash of old car bump, I came across this brochure, and I felt it appropriate to do a video on it now, as 1979's Volvos illustrate perfectly the very conservative nature of the company's offerings, but highlights as well their unique awareness of the market and of people's needs in a car. And these two points allow us to understand just how Volvo became the go-to manufacturer for vast swathes of the middle class all across the world. Now, this brochure is rather short, but before we dive in, Volvo are only making two distinct models, but that's not the reason for its brevity. In fact, I can't quite work out why they decided to print this. It's lacking in detail to the point that it might as well be a pocket-sized leaflet, but as we flick through it, we might grow to understand how Volvo felt perfect confidence in presenting their cars in this manner. This first page describes Volvo's philosophy and scratches at the surface of some of the company's actions that are intrinsic in understanding how and why Volvos in this era exist as they do. The first talking point is towards the bottom of the paragraph, that the 1979 Volvos again demonstrate Volvo's singular commitment to providing the motorist with products that are built to withstand the test of time whilst offering outstanding value for money. When it comes to Volvo, that point is a bit of a cliché, but not in the way that I'm seeing it here. The supposed reliability and dependability of Volvos is well documented, and there's nothing insightful to be seen in that sphere. Instead, I'm seeing it from a stylistic point of view. Volvo's offerings, as we will actually get into at some point, were very conservatively styled, but also magnificently styled in their own way to ensure that with incremental aesthetic updates, they would still appear fresh and modern for decades to come. In fact, the two distinct models featured in this brochure had been built together for three years and would continue to be for a further 12. The test of time statement is something that would be proved absolutely correct as even the zenith of this model range hadn't yet been reached, in a time frame where most manufacturers' offerings were hitting or had just passed their peaks. And that point brings us very nicely into the second statement that I'd like to analyse, the first in the second paragraph. The Volvo philosophy of product development is not one of change for change's sake. Quite the contrary. Volvo believe that quality, safety, reliability and comfort are more important than being fashionable. That is one hell of a statement, and one that would see shrieks of horror if uttered by a modern car manufacturer. But it's exactly what I've just said in response to the sentence before, and this philosophy is exactly why Volvo became such a powerful name in conservative, yet smart, dignified and dependable transport. This is at the centre of the middle class's love for Volvo in period. Let's pull out the safety element as one to look at, and add that to a sentence from lower down this paragraph. Volvo carry out a continuous program of research and development. This is to ensure that Volvo products meet not only today's safety standards, but those likely to exist in 10 years' time. Much like the reliability one, it is a bit of a Volvo cliché, and for good reason. But we cannot underestimate the power of this factor in ensuring Volvo's success through the 1970s and 1980s, a time before public awareness of standardised crash tests and the end of the period in which many American cars were slated for their lack of basic safety. Think Chevy Corvair and Ford Pinto, then the image of the family of four and their dog all happily secured in their Volvo estate. It's a really powerful marketing tool that served Volvo well for decades. In fact, one of the cars we'll be discussing in a moment, the Volvo 300 series, still had safety at the centre of its marketing 10 years later, and I'll put up a card in the corner to my video on it, which features such an advert. At the bottom of this page is a rundown of the range, and then on the following page, an equipment list for every trim level. 
but will jump to and fro when it's appropriate to. As for now, let's get into the heart of the range and our first car for today, the Volvo 343 DL. At this point, three years after its introduction, the 300 series was still only available in this one specification. As I'm sure we all know, the 300 isn't really a Volvo, as it was designed and produced by DAF in the Netherlands, just badged up as a Volvo, as the Swedes had taken a controlling stake in the car making side of DAF in 1975. At its launch, the 343 wasn't a fantastic car, if just for its sheer lack of quality in virtually every component. By 1979, the 300 series had undergone its first major revision. Call this one, therefore, as a Phase 2 Volvo 300, just for the sake of clarity. Externally, though, it's still very close to the original DAF design, minus some hubcaps and plus a side rubbing strip. And its DAF origins are something that Volvo actually seems to employ in its marketing spiel. For example, the amazing road holding based on a 50-50 weight distribution and the Dion rear axle. Those attributes are things that Volvo would never have considered had they designed this car. But for DAF, they were part of the course. What always set DAF apart was its variomatic transmission. An early form of what we know today as a continuously variable transmission, or CVT. But in the form DAF had engineered it, it had to be mounted at the back of the car, in front of the rear axle. And to make that rear end perform properly with a transaxle, they opted to fit a De Dion tube to the DAF 66, launched in 1972, and of course the later 300 series. This kind of rear suspension rested on run-of-the-mill leaf springs, but for non-independent suspension it is very effective, ensuring consistent camber angles. The fact that Volvo decided to promote this is interesting in itself, but far more interesting is the lack of a mention for variomatic. The truth was that, in Europe, automatic transmissions weren't really very welcome in any form, and Variomatic increased the price of the car, so for 1979, a manual transmission was introduced. Still mounted at the back, like a Porsche, but this one change was the key that many Europeans needed to get them to accept the 300 series as a possible mode of transport. But back to Volvo's marketing for a moment, and there's one glaring statement up here that made me giggle. The high quality finish. Clearly, whoever wrote this had never sat in a 300 series of this era, because quality is not a word I would ever associate with it. In fact, Volvo felt the need to change every single interior component through the life of the car, as it just wasn't good enough. Even worse, Volvo apparently offered owners of early 343s a free upgrade to a later one, just to get the car off the road, they were so bad. But that doesn't mean that the 300 series as a whole was a bad car, just that the early ones weren't up to scratch. As it was developed further, it grew into a very desirable, well-appointed car, but in 1979, that still wasn't the case. The clearest change that opened the car's market up was the aforementioned manual gearbox, but as I mentioned at the beginning of this page, the 343DL was still the only specification available at this point. Immediately after the publication of this brochure, the Volvo 345 became available with five doors, and later the Volvo 360 with the 2.0-litre red block engine from the larger four-cylinder Volvos. These additions, along with posher trim levels, entered the 300 series into more niches, and accelerated sales dramatically. From the car that isn't a Volvo at all, to the seminal, best-loved, archetypal Volvo, the 200 series, beginning here with the four-cylinder, four-door Volvo 244. If we noticed that the 300 series was only afforded half a page in the entire brochure, but just the 244 gets a full page spread. Such were Volvo's priorities at this point. But with the 200 series supposed prestige and engineering, its general shape actually dates back to its predecessor, the 140 series launched in 1966. But to be fair, why change such a good shape? 
While the 200 series is the definition of a brick on wheels, the shape is actually incredibly well sculpted. There is just enough definition in the glass house and flanks to make it a really good looking car, especially considering the conservative, if intelligent, nature of its intended customer. It's a feature the later 700 and 900 series Volvos wouldn't repeat, being criticised in period for taking the boxiness as its core stylistic trait, as opposed to the 200 series which was boxy because that's just how it ended up. The side profile is straight from the old 140. The rear end was incrementally changed from that original 140 shape to the final design we see a glimpse of here with the wraparound lamps. The front of the car is the most incidental, as the old 140 had a typical mid-60s style, but this flatter, almost shoveled front grille was grafted on when the 200 series was launched in 1974 due to findings on Volvo's safety research vehicles. As I said, it's all coincidental. The three trim levels on offer at this point are the DL, GL and GLE. But rather strangely, the car they chose to be photographed was a base model, the 244DL, with the smaller headlamps and non-metallic paint. But for 1979, the specification is very good. You have the obligatory headlamp wipers, daytime running lights and a rear fog lamp, but also smaller touches like a tachometer, something that was still considered a sporty option, and the mid-range GL has metallic paint something other manufacturers would charge a fortune for, and even a heated driver's seat. Bear in mind also that this is only the lesser four-cylinder model, with a 2.1 litre variant of the red block that would end up in the Volvo 360 I mentioned earlier. But over the page is the full fat Volvo 264, complete with all of the chrome. Here is where Volvo's numbering scheme goes a little bit insane, as the 200 series is larger than the 300 series, and though the 260 has six cylinders, the 360 only has four cylinders. But we'll gloss over all that for the 2.7 litre V6 that was co-developed between Volvo, Peugeot and Renault, producing a very modest 148 brake horsepower. But it's the specifications on this page that are most interesting. Alongside the run-of-the-mill 244 GL and GLE are the 264 TE with an extended wheelbase, and of course the famous 262C, built by Bertoni in Italy and removing completely the classy, understated Volvo-ness of the standard car, and replacing it with fake American pomp and heraldry, turning what I believe to be a good-looking car into the ugliest car Volvo has ever made. But on this page we can pretend that it doesn't exist and instead concentrate on how Volvo differentiated the 6s from the 4s, and generally it's chrome. Quite a lot of it, as a matter of fact. To the point where it is a little bit shouty and a little bit garish compared to the simple frontage of the 240. Even the headlamp wipers are chromed, and though the Volvo badge being off centre does look a little bit odd in an otherwise conservative design, the chrome slats on the grille are something that would still be recognisable on Volvos all the way up to the late 2000s. But engines and sheer specifications were never the bread and butter to Volvo's attractions, as it is finally time to take a look from the safety perspective. And the two pages we've seen thus far on the 200 series highlight four of the car's safety systems. The cars have side impact protection and crumple zones, as well as split circuit braking. And if you remember how good cars used to be, good all round visibility. Remember that? But these are a small part of the features that all Volvos came with, including the little 343, as the whole range also had rollover protection, front head restraints and a collapsible steering column, as well as seatbelts for every passenger as standard, something very few cars actually had in 1979. The final full page spread dedicated to the 200 series is for the famous estate cars, the Volvo 245 and 265. There's very little that hasn't already been said, but I will make this one statement. These cars aren't as big as you remember them. In period, they were huge, 
cavernous and with immense road presence, but today, in a world of inflated faux off-roaders, they seem quite petite. Slim but long, but that's how cars used to be. Even with that, there's still 43 cubic feet of load space with the seats up and 70 with the seats down. Though they aren't actually that wide, there's still a heck of a lot of space in the back of a 5-door 200. The two cars on display here have each engine, a 4 and a 6, but the yellow 245 is a GLE, the top spec available in period, and that gives us the only chance to see for real in this brochure the larger headlamps coupled to the more basic grille, and I think that looks ace. Before we move on, I just want to say one more thing, and that's the kink in the estate's rear window. The car was designed with the saloon in mind, so the estate came second, and they weren't prepared to make two different doors, so that kink is the roofline of the saloon, but the car just carries on while the door droops down. The later 700 series did it the other way round, and that's why that car has such an upright rear screen. The more you know. On the back of the brochure are all the technical specifications, so if you're interested, then just pause the video now. It's at this point that I think it suits to discuss Volvo's confidence in such a brief view of their products. My view is that Volvo in 1979 were in a relatively powerful position. They were cementing their status in the UK and US especially as the go-to car maker for the discerning and intelligent families of the middle class, as I mentioned earlier. And on the surface, not too much had changed from the year before. The alterations were usability-based, and were examples of Volvo knowing their place and understanding that they could keep the same basic models in production for an awfully long time while keeping them feeling fresh and modern by implementing incremental upgrades, therefore keeping them from looking old hat once an all-new competitor came around, as almost every other European car maker did. In 1979, the 300 series hadn't yet hit its stride. As I mentioned the other week, it took them until 1983 for 100,000 cars to be produced, but through such upgrades, a growing middle-class market and simple word of mouth, over a million cars had been produced by 1988. No other manufacturer could make a rather old design so successful. As for the 200 series, the basic shape had been around for 13 years by 1979, but it still had another 3 years until it was complemented by the 700 series, and another 14 years to live in all. 13 years is considered a rather long life for a manufacturer's most important model, but for Volvo in this era, there was just no panic. They were quietly confident in themselves, and that confidence is abundantly clear in this brochure. So on that note, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, then please do click like and subscribe to TwinCam as well. I'm forever indebted to my wonderful Patreon supporters, so if you'd like to support me that way, then please do follow the link in the description. And I'll have more videos coming along soon.